Good morning and welcome to this webinar on uh, Shrems 2. My name is uh, Mark Orchison. I'm the founder and managing director of Nine. And uh, joining me today is uh, Heidi Ann O'Neill, um, our in house legal counsel. Um, they want to say hello to everyone, Heidi. Hi, everybody. Welcome to um, our webinar. Um, so um, I'll be taking you through the first uh, outline of uh, and the context behind Shrems 2. And then Heidi is going to be providing the history and some more of the technical detail um, uh, relating to the topic. In terms of housekeeping, it'd be great to uh, have uh, any questions through the uh, duration of the webinar. Um, when, I'm, when I'm speaking, uh, Heidi will seek to, to, to pick those out and, and vice versa. Um, but obviously, if, if not, then we can pick those up um, outside. I'm always happy to answer your questions. Um, the next webinar we have is later in October, um, another one on cybersecurity in schools, what are schools doing to protect themselves? And we are um, going to be joined on that webinar with some directors of IT from schools uh, within the UK and also internationally. Um, for those of you who know, we have some organizations joining us today that aren't schools, but in the context of Shrems too, um, probably 90% uh, of the people who registered today, and we had a good number, almost 80, um, are, are um, from a, an education background. Um, you'll all be familiar, and I have no shame in plugging our new app, um, which is the first module, Data Privacy and Protection. You will see in the, in the bottom uh, corner of the slide that you can all sign up for, your, uh, for a limited trial um, of our app and we'll be referring to some of the pieces of some of the features of the app today. Um, there will be other aspects of the app that are being launched in the, over the next six months. So it's a governance platform to support you in your data privacy and protection compliance. Um, but also we have a safeguarding governance module that's coming out and also cybersecurity and IT management. So uh, signing up uh, sooner rather than later, not only will it be uh, cheaper, but also you will be able to get yourself more familiar with the core technology because it's it's not just around data privacy and protection. There are uh, there's a project management methodology to it that enables you to really reduce the workload and operationalize um, your compliance program. So context of Shrems team. Now, the we all live in a world of of data and information flows with uh, data moving across the globe, and a core part of um, data protection law historically has been forcing organizations to really understand where data uh, where data moves. So as it, as it moves digitally from your computer, um, it may move through your local school network, but then it will move to servers uh, within the country. And then depending on where it's being transferred to, it will move across the globe. And essentially what data protection law mandates is that you as an organization, you really understand how that digital information goes from your realm, from your building, um, into the into the ether, into the internet, and essentially determine where that essentially lands and what are the risks to that data when it when it resides in a different country. So within the EU, the GDPR is very very clear. It says, well, if you are processing personal data, then you need to determine what the risks are to the rights and freedoms of the data subjects then you need to put in uh, proportionate security measures to ensure that, that whilst you're handling that personal data while it's in your care, that it is essentially secure. And within the European Union, um, the GDPR is in law forcing all organisations to do that. Referring back to um, a, a couple of the other web webinars we've done, um, the, the role of the data protection officer is to really understand where the risks are to processing and where the, where the greatest risks are and to focus their efforts on securing that personal data. And well, whilst the personal data is within the realms of the EU and when it's in the realms of uh, the GDPR, um, it's quite clear that as a, as a data protection officer, you know that, that whilst the data remains within the EU, it's gonna have greater protections. But when that data moves outside of the EU, the protections are, are perhaps less so unless there is a robust data protection law um, within that specific country and uh, more so whether, whether that country has, a, has an adequacy agreement with the European Union to ensure that the protections afforded by the GDPR are enforced within that, within that local country. So, so with, the, with the world of data and information flows, you as an organization is understanding where your data goes to 
and who it's shared with. In the right hand on the right hand side of this, down towards Southeast Asia, you have um, an example of schools there that are um, sharing information across borders, and the organisations they are sharing their data with is 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 other schools. Um, whilst within the European Union, you've got the example there of the school sharing data with other schools in the EU, but also um, organisations within um, within the US and with Africa. And within your own school, you need to understand uh, uh, where all your information goes through and, and have some form of map in your head, or, or, or actually within your record of processing to explain where that where that data goes to. So the, the context behind Trends 2, as I just explained, is that um, there are obligations on the controller, um, which is the school or you as a business, to un understand where data is transferred to. That's the first, that's the first point. Um, and there are other obligations uh, for countries and organisations that, that reside outside of the EU, um, including Switzerland, uh, in Thailand, Japan, New Zealand and Brazil. Um, all of those organisations have adopted um, similar types of requirements for the organisations residing within those countries to do exactly the same thing. Um, and as we see the, um, the influence of the GDPR across the globe, um, and as countries adopt their own flavour of the GDPR, we're likely to see the same implications. And um, the, the, the decision around Trends 2, which Heide has to come on to and describe in more detail, um, has created additional complexities in terms of um, understanding uh, how data is transferred. Because even if you're in the EU, for example, and you may not be transferring uh, uh, information directly to the US, for example, which is where the Trends 2 uh, decision was, was primarily focused, you might be sharing data with, with a third party that then stores the data you shared with them within the US. So consequently, you, you have a chain of, of information flows. Um, and uh, uh, indirectly, the direct is being uh, the, the personal data is being being shared, and, and you as an organisation need to map out um, uh, uh, what that what, what that is. And the uh, sort of one of the one of the reasons behind this, in terms of why you have these indirect links, is that the European Union, by the virtue of of setting up free trade agreements with other countries, are passing are passing their laws. Um, into the, into local law, and I think this is quite a good quote from the Telegraph um, earlier on in in September. That sort of gives um, uh, a synopsis or, or a good representation of actually how it's politically perceived um, what the EU are trying to do, not only with their data protection laws, but but other laws that the EU bloc has been has been has been coming up with, and then how are how those are being transposed into um, into local law. So essentially the context behind the trends too, and after this next slide, um, Heidi will be providing the, uh, the detail. Um, data is seen as an export, and if you are collecting the personal data of individuals that reside within the EU or those other countries that are re referred to, and you're exporting it to exporting it to a different country, you're expected to really understand what the protections are applied to that data as it lands in that new country, and what basically the government um, authorities have access to that data, and how having access to the data of the nationals from the EU can sort of influence um, or have an impact on those on those on those nationals. Um, so there are legal implications, there are legal requirements, and with the the Schrems to um, decision, then um, the, uh, the, the there can be um, it can lead to fines and other other dissuasive action. But we'll, again, we'll be touching upon those um, uh, later on within this webinar. So overall, that should provide you with a context about um, about Schrems to the implications for yourselves. And now um, I'm handing over to to Heidi to give an overview of the history, what it means, and then we're going to go on to what the impact is for you as a as a school and what you need to be thinking about what you're doing with the personal data you collect and what you transfer. So Heidi, over to you. Thank you, Mark. I've been having fun on the chat. We've got some um, great participants this morning, so welcome to you all. So yes, let's look at the history of um, 
of what's been going on here. So as we've just seen, the GDPR forbids transfers of EU citizens' personal data outside the EU unless it's transferred in accordance with its provisions. Now, as Marcus said, one mechanism for allowing transfers is an adequacy decision, which is basically the EU agreeing that the country with that adequacy decision has similar measures in place to the GDPR to assure the protection of EU citizens' personal data. Now, the US did have a partial adequacy decision in so far that there was initially a regime in place called Safe Harbor, which some of you may remember. And this enabled companies in the US to sign up to a, a self-certification scheme. I said that right, self-certification scheme, confirming that they would protect EU citizens data if it was transferred to them. Now, Mr. Schrems had a, a bee in his bonnet um, about this and about his data being transferred by Facebook Island to the US. He believed and has always believed that there is insufficient protection for EU citizens when their data is transferred to the US. And so he took action to prove it. Now, in his first attempt, which is cunningly called the Schrems 1 decision, the European Court of Justice swept away safe harbour and the privacy shield developed as a replacement. And this worked on a similar basis that companies had to self-certify their standards. And this was approved by the EU Commission as being um, sufficient to allow transfers back to the US. However, uh, Mr. Schrems could still see issues with uh, the privacy shield, um, particularly with the access that US law enforcement authorities have to EU citizens' data. Now, that coupled with the very limited rights that EU citizens have um, to be able to challenge that access to their data um, became a, a big problem for him. Um, and so he kept up his argument. Um, and in July this year, the, um, the Court of Justice agreed with Mr. Schrems and decided that, yes, the privacy shield um, wasn't up to scratch and, um, and they invalidated it. Now, for good measure, they didn't just stick with the privacy shield. They also muddied the water with standard contractual clauses. Um, now, these are pre-GDPR model clauses, which are developed or have been developed, should I say, by the EU Commission um, and are considered an alternative mechanism for transfers to the US and other countries outside the EU without adequacy decisions in their favour. However, the same issue Mr. Schrems has raised with the Privacy Shield also applies to these, these clauses. And the court has now recognised this. Um, and what it said is that EU entities now need to make additional due diligence checks and implement supplementary measures, we say supplementary measures, to these clauses where necessary. So that's the TREMS 2 decision. That's where we currently are. We do not have an, uh, a replacement for the privacy shield at the moment. And the court hasn't explained what these supplementary measures to the uh, standard contractual clauses should be either. So it's all very satisfactory, um, unsatisfactory, should I say. Um, and we are waiting for specific guidance from those that we normally look to. So the EU Commission, um, supervisory authorities um, across the EU and um, European Data Protection Board as well um, to see if they can take us forward. Um, now, we're going to discuss what this is going to mean for your schools and organisations later on in the presentation. But for now, I'll just hand you back to Mark. Great. Thanks for that history um, there, Heidi. So, so practically speaking, um, and we're seeing the questions coming in, so um, which is great, and I'll get onto some of those in, in, in a while. Um, I know this slide looks like a bit of a mess, but, but bear with me. Um, I, will, I will explain it. Um, so essentially, the Schrems too has said that that, that any um, any data being personal data being transferred to the US um, is basically illegal, and essentially there will be sanctions. And what you've got there, Paul, I think you've identified it. Yes, you've got fines and sanctions, but also there's a, yeah, a risk of compensation claims. Um, and essentially, at, at its heart, when you look at okay, what are the risk of compensation claims? It's, it's what are the what are the risks to the rights and freedoms of that natural person through the sharing of personal data with that third party who may be located within the USA. And uh, what, what I'm trying to describe here in terms of this, this slide is that at the very, at the very top, you have the, the silhouettes of the, uh, the teachers and the children, and you've got the school in the middle. 
and essentially as a school what they what the core risks are is that you're collecting personal data um, and you've got a range of different personal data there from medical through to financial and first names and surname and then and then that that personal data is being shared with these third parties and on the left hand side you've got uh, nwea and power school for example or you've got zoom microsoft um, uh, and google to to to, to the right hand side and in many cases what most of our schools, if I've been being being entirely transparent, don't understand and haven't done the analysis to work out that once they collect that personal data and put it into those platforms, they don't know where it goes and who has access to it. And in many cases, that personal data is then stored on servers within within the within the US. And essentially, what the uh, what the um, European authorities are saying is that well if it goes to the US then the then the public authorities and here you've got a picture of an FBI spy essentially could have access to that personal data and therefore can be uh, can can be observing um, the uh, the um, the data subjects uh, of who the the, the the GDPR covers and that's not something that's acceptable within within the European Union and therefore it's not acceptable for you as a, an organization that's within the European Union to, put, to give that personal data over to an organization within within the US and uh, and uh, that be that be the core risk but going back to you know and, 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 and almost every organization within the European Union has been transferring personal data to 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 the US and continues to do so um, regardless to whether the um, uh, regardless to the Schrems two decision because they're saying that that those transfers are illegal so so what you as an organization need to be doing is going okay well uh, you know we will more than likely be continuing to uh, transfer at this moment in time personal data to the USA um, but what is the actual risk to the rights and freedoms? Because although that is illegal, what what you know if we're only transferring the first name and the last name, um, the likely risk to the rights and freedoms is 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 very small. Whereas if we're transferring um, a lot more information, even down to psyched reports to the US, in actual fact that, that, that that's a high risk processing. Therefore, there's, there's potential to be a high risk impact um, on the rights and freedoms of the data subjects whose personal data you are collecting and processing. So your data protection officer should be going right. Well, my priority is to work out where are the higher higher risk processing activities and the higher risk transfers, <clears throat> and look to mitigate those because it's those areas that are likely going to bring action from the data subjects or from fines or whether just dissuasive action from the supervisory authority. So essentially, the the legal the legal impact is to is to say stop, but practically speaking. Um, with the decision, that's unlikely, and it's unlikely that the authorities are going to take legal action against every institution um, within Europe, within Europe that is still continuing to transfer um, categories of personal data to 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 the US or to other organisations in other countries where it's deemed that, um, uh, given the Schrems two decision, that uh, it, it has extended. So, for me, my core message at this moment in time, and we'll, and we'll continue with this theme through the rest of the presentation, is to really look to the categories of personal data that you are that you're transferring to these countries, and what is the what are the risks to the rights and freedoms, and we'll show you how you can do that in a in a in a in a, in a short while. Now, some countries um, uh, have this thing called an adequacy, adequacy agreement that, um, and essentially the privacy shield formally was some sort of like adequacy agreement, a light touch one. But some countries have this adequacy agreement where you can transfer personal data between countries and you can do so under the basis of the GDPR because the GDPR is essentially recognized in law in these other countries. And um, uh, Heidi, um, is, uh, is going to be, uh, hopefully, Heidi, this is your slide, I think, um, is going to be describing some more details in terms of the impact on, on schools. Thank you, Mark. Yes, it is. Can I just um, clarify as well? I've I've been I've been picked up by some eagle-eyed um, uh, people on the um, on the on the chat that I have mentioned EU citizens, and of course the GDPR does extend to all of those in the union, whether they're residents or citizens. So apologies for any confusion there. Um, but when we're looking at the the GDPR, of course we're looking at those within the union. So <clears throat> I've um, I've cast a, a sea of darkness over the, the current position. Um, so let's have a look at how um, this actually impacts you and your organisation. So as the matter stands, as a result of Schrems 2, we can't use the privacy shield to transfer data outside of the EU and the standard contractual clauses are looking shaky. 
So this means we need to be careful when we transfer data to US service providers and also third countries using um, standard contractual clauses. Um, so for you, this means that you need to be very aware of where your data is flowing. Um, if you haven't already completed a data map or created a record of processing detailing how data flows within your organization, I would suggest that now is a really good time to do it, um, as you need to be aware of where transfers are being made from the EU to the US using the Privacy Shield and standard contractual clauses, um, and to third countries using standard contractual clauses. Um, and I would say also that um, you also need to be aware where transfers are being made that perhaps don't have the protection that, that they should have, um, regardless of those, those two mechanisms that I've mentioned. So, <clears throat> excuse me, you might not be in a position to do um, anything about the mechanism for transfer at the moment. But as I've just said, you can be very aware of where your data is going um, so that you can be very aware and um, you are in the best possible position, I suppose, to act on any guidance going forward. Um, now, the upside to my sea of darkness that I've, that I've spread is that supervisory authorities aren't yet enforcing. There are no official grace periods for this um, hiatus we find ourselves in with the, with the Privacy Shield. But it seems that regulators across the union are very understanding of the situation that European businesses have literally been thrown into, and of course, US companies as well. Um, now, if you're outside the EU, I'd just like to say that um, you need to be aware that the GDPR may still apply to you indirectly if you are processing personal re data relating to somebody in the union. Um, so you need to be aware of what is happening with that data as well and where that is going. Um, now, we know that enforcing the GDPR outside the EU can be rather unpredictable, but it's not impossible. So if you do nothing else as a result of this presentation, I would just like to say that um, I think you should make sure that you map your processing activities and understand what companies you are using to process your data and very importantly, um, understand where they are based. So moving on, let's just see what you can do in practice to help yourselves. Now, as I've said before, there's no definitive guidance yet from those we usually look to for guidance. But what we think at nine you should be doing for the US and other countries where you are using standard contractual clauses is this. Carry out a risk assessment. So again, I'm using the term, but look at your data map or your record of processing. Be very clear about what personal data you are transferring who that personal data relates to and also why you're transferring it then consider the risks associated with the use of that personal data look at whether a data protection impact assessment has already been completed um, now i do keep mentioning the data map um, or your record of processing but it's such an important part of your data governance because it creates a foundation, um, if you like, of information which you can reference and get all this information from. Um, if it's been kept accurate and up to date, it's a great source of information. Um, and our Nine app can help you here. And, and Mark's um, going to tell you some more about its functionality a bit later on. So going back to what you can do, let's consider whether the processing activity you've identified is actually necessary for your organization. Um, and if it is, drill down further, consider whether the data being processed is also necessary. Do you need to transfer all that data? Um, now, remember that the GDPR needs you to transfer the absolute minimum amount of data um, to achieve the purpose you're, you're, you're intending to achieve. So um, you always need to reduce that personal data to the absolute minimum. Also, you can consider what measures you can take to keep the personal data secure. So when you're looking at the information you're processing and transferring, look at whether it can be anonymized or pseudonymized. Um, and if it can, make sure only your organization has the key to re-identify that data. Now, we've talked about due diligence. You should carry out due diligence anyway, but you should now, according to the court, be asking further questions to see whether supplementary measures um, are going to be required. So we would think that that means asking your service providers questions about the data protection laws in their country so that you can assess how it measures up to the GDPR. Um, for the US, in light of the Schrems 2 decision, um, you might want to ask your companies about 
whether they're subject to surveillance of US um, and law enforcement uh, authorities or whether they're required to submit to those laws if data is requested by an authority. Um, and I would say throughout this process, just don't forget to document all your decision making. Um, now, moving forward, we obviously all need to be aware of the developments regarding SHREMS 2. And some supervisory authorities uh, are starting to make noises about what you should be doing with international transfers in the wake of SHREMS. So I'd suggest you keep an eye out for this. Um, and we also know that the EU Commission is working diligently behind the scenes to update the SCCs, the standard contractual clauses, because we know that they were drafted way before the GDPR came into being. Um, and we're hoping that a draft, a new draft, a new um, uh, set of clauses might be coming out soon. We have our fingers crossed that they might be out before Christmas. Now, whilst all that's going on, um, work is also being carried out in the US on potentially strengthening the framework to replace the privacy shield. Um, but this might take a little while to come on, bearing in mind what we know is going on there um, at the moment. So in the meantime, with Mr. Schrems, he's still not happy. And he has submitted 101 complaints across Europe about companies that are continuing to transfer data to the US despite the decision. Now, the European Data Protection Board is aware of all these complaints um, and they've set up a task force to deal with it to ensure that there's a consistent and uniform approach across the, um, across the union. But we still need to wait to see where this takes us. Now, um, I'm going to pass back to Mark now so he can let you know how we can support you on this journey. Um, and, uh, and I'll carry on looking at, at the chat and see if we can pick up some questions after the presentation. Perfect. Thanks, Heidi. So what I want to do is I want to focus on point two of this of this slide. Um, and Paul, I think you, you touched upon this. You touched upon this earlier. Um, as, a, as an organization um, under GPR, one of the principles is being lawful, fair and transparent. Um, and in order to reduce the risk of any action from a data subject or any action from a um, uh, from a supervisor authority, you need to be communicating um, with whom, to whom you are transferring personal data to. Um, and you do this within your privacy notice. So if you look at your privacy notice at the moment, and it's not clear in terms of where personal data is being transferred to and to, and to which, which countries and to which, which, which companies, then that's something that you need to be work, working upon. And you get that information from your record of processing, which is something that, that the, the, our app does. And I'm going to show you some, some more examples of that. So you're looking at, through your record of processing, the, the, the personal data that's being collected and, and who it's being shared with. And then you're ensuring that you have communicated that effectively through your privacy notice. So your data subjects actually know that their personal data is being transferred to those uh, to those countries where the Schrems 2 decision um, uh, 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 has affected. You're also looking at the processing risks. So what is the risk of, of sending that, that personal data yeah, that, that you've collected um, on the individuals? And uh, you're looking at the, as, a, as an organization around your SHREMS 2 compliance program, you're looking at the higher risk processing activities. Um, and that's essentially to the providers um, where you where you send um, more categories of personal data than just, for example, just someone's first name and last name. Importantly, when you're, when you're doing this, you're also looking to differentiate whether you are the, 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 the controller of that personal data, whether you're a joint controller, whether you're, whether you're a processor. So in the instance of um, a Paul, I'll, I'll refer to your question that I can just see in the corner of my eye there um, uh, around is Livestorm, for example, um, uh, uh, are, are, are we sharing personal data with Livestorm? Well, that's your nine aren't doing that. So Livestorm, for example, would most likely be, be a controller in their own right because they are um, asking, you know, they, you need your details to actually to um, uh, to uh, to uh, have access to the webinar. So, so you, you as an organization, you're, you're seeking to really be clear in terms of where you are the controller and where you are a processor uh, with the personal data that you're collecting. That is in your record of processing and therefore what your legal obligations are, ensuring it's in your privacy, privacy notice and, in, and ensure that you understand what the processing risk is. Um, within, the, within the nine app that, that you all have access to in terms of the trial, Within your record of processing, there are ten categories um, that the that the that the Article Twenty Nine Working Party have identified that are higher risk processing, um, that then require what's called a, a DPIA, which is that risk assessment. And if you were on the webinar um, around uh, the data, the role of the data protection officer, we would have showed you what those categories are. 
So within your record of processing, you will then identify whether there are any um, uh, any specific risks associated with the processing activity, and one of those is a transfer of the personal data outside of the of the EU or your local jurisdiction. That then gives rise to a greater risk of processing and leads to the need for, or at least the consideration for a DPIA. So within within the Nine app, you you can by creating your record of processing within um, within the app, you are then identifying where or which processing activities. Um, uh, uh, take place outside of your your jurisdiction, and you also identify the third parties um, <clears throat> within the DPI DPIA module here. Which I've, I've, I've got a screenshot. Um, it clearly allows you to to identify where you are transferring the personal data to, but also um, in terms of the lawful, fairness, and transparent. Um, where you are transferring personal data outside of your jurisdiction, it requires you to capture where you have communicated that transfer to your data subjects. So in terms of your governance program, the app allows you to join the dots between these requirements so you can clearly report upon across all your processing activities what are the higher risk ones, where the, where, where the transfers go outside of your jurisdiction and where have you in fact communicated that to your data subjects. And evidently, if you haven't communicated that to your data subjects, there's some work for you to do, but at least you understand where your, where your compliance risks are and then you can take proportionate effort to mitigate the risks that you've identified as part of your compliant program. Um, and the other slide I've got here in terms of the screenshot of, um, of DPIAs is that the when we're looking at um, the risks of transfer, um, uh, the DPIA process uh, provides the mechanism to you to work out what are the higher risk processing uh, activities to all the third parties in third countries um, or, or in the US. Uh, and it, it allows you to identify clearly what the risks are so you can manage those and you can do that consistently across all of your processing activities. So in terms of taking the, the, the trial um, and then take, taking, taking the license, if that's, uh, if that's what you choose, um, you are able to manage your compliance program and do so effectively and also intuitively. Over the course of um, October, um, you will be familiar if you joined the webinar uh, yesterday. At the moment, it's the European um, Cyber Security Month. So we have an offer on for all of uh, anyone signing up for a license, not a trial, a license during the month of October. Um, we will also do a cybersecurity vulnerability assessment of all your IT systems and services, or we'll do a cybersecurity review of your cloud platforms, such as Google or Office 365, depending on which ones that you have. But that's only for organizations that sign up in the month of um, month of October. So I do encourage you to, to, to get on a trial, because um, not only do we, um, will, will we be supporting you in terms of your compliance program, um, but you have access to those offer. And additionally, within the um, within the app, there is a Shrems 2 video in two minutes. So rather than having to go through a 35 minute webinar, um, there's a two minute video that describes it. Um, we have full analysis within the app on 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 Shrems 2, um, so you can read uh, uh, about the about the impact. Um, so in terms of uh, in terms of the recap, um, the 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 key message would be to identify the third parties in in the countries affected by Shrems 2, um, where uh, where personal data is being transferred to, really work out the categories of personal personal data that's being transferred, try to reduce the categories that you're transferring to, updating your privacy notice to ensure that your data subjects know um, where personal data is being transferred, and effectively try to manage the risks. And the risks are either continuing, you know, you can't mitigate it, you need to continue to use that third party, or you're looking to um, reduce the risks and, and, and use and use someone different. So um, for, for us, in terms of the snapshot of uh, uh, Shrems 2 on this webinar, that's where we are. Um, do we have any questions from anyone that we'd like asking? Um, Heidi, have you been keeping an eye on the questions? I have, Mark, thank you. And there's some really good questions coming through, um, some that are making me kind of scratch my head and think a little bit more. Um, so let's have a look at, um, can I, I'm not aware, does it, can everybody see the questions or shall I just clarify what um, Miguel has said? Um, he's got a, um, an issue with um, enrollment contracts, Mark, and he's saying that um, families entering the school sign up to obviously contracts and he's wondering whether he can use Article 49.1c um, now that's to, that's a derogation to do with using um, contracts as a mechanism for transferring data, um, and he he qualifies his um, his 
uh, question by saying that the ICO specifically says that the exception can only work for occasional transfers, but the GDPR doesn't mention anything about occasional um, and the transfers are done on a regular basis. So what I just wanted to say to Miguel was actually um, there isn't anything in the main text of the GDPR about things being occasional. But if you look at recital 111, um, the, the GDPR does qualify itself by saying that um, the transfer must be occasional and necessary in relation to a contract or, or legal claim. Um, so you can only use that derogation, it would seem, for um, occasional uh, transfers. So for enrolment contracts, that, that might be a bit of a no-no for that, for that uh, using that particular derogation. Yeah, I, I think I've, we have looked at that um, that specific one before when uh, in terms of the the, the the occasional transfer and the GDPR then does set out um, uh, other instances. So, for example, the, the consent, you can go and get consent if you have also identified what the risks are of that of that transfer. Um, I think the the starting point here is, is that in many instances of our of our of our of our schools is that um some people seem to be just jumping to we can't do anything we can't do any transfers um and sort of i sort of going back to the point uh, i i sort of operate in more of the gray area because every organization has been affected by this and what the gdpr really requires of you is to you understand what the risks are and the rights and freedoms of of of, of uh, natural persons um to the processing activities that are taking place and specifically to the transfers that are taking place so as, an, as a school, you can't make any decisions um, about what you should be doing or what action should you be taking in terms of whether you're going to obtain consent or whether you're going to put into contract without first understanding what the risks are of that processing activity and the risks of, of the processing activity specifically link to the categories of data um, that are being transferred, but also to the demographic type of your data subjects um, that are, or, or, or whose personal data that are, that's being collected. Um, Heidi, is there anything else that, that we have coming through? Yeah, Paul's just um, kind of caught up with the, you know, um, as, as kind of put some further comments about using the derogation in 491C. And I agree that he's saying that um, it's necessary, is whether the, tr the transfer is necessary is key. Um, and consent, which is another derogation, is not always appropriate in a school setting. And I completely understand. It puts us in a, in a, a bit of a lacuna um, because... Um, you you are then only looking for standard contractual clauses to to fill that gap. Now, um, Mark, there's a, a an interesting com uh, question come from Kim, um, saying that they've done their data mapping, um, and they've got some um, issues with external providers in the interim. Must I inform parents that we transfer to the US in the privacy statements, and is it okay to show we are effectively breaking the law? Um, it's a bit of a tricky one, isn't it, Mark? Because privacy statements, we know, need to be very transparent with data subjects. So we need to explain where we're transferring data to. Um, I wouldn't necessarily want to put in my privacy statement that we're breaking the law, but I don't think that's what Kim was, was necessarily um, uh, uh, um, talking about. But yes, we still need to be... Um, uh, transparent with our with our data subjects about what we're doing with the data, um, and don't forget this is a global issue now. This is um, this isn't just affecting um, a, a small number of schools. This is affecting businesses across the world that are trying to transfer to to US because the GDPR is looked at as the gold standard for um, data protection. And so all the world is looking at, well, if it's not good enough for the GDPR, then it's not going to be good enough for us. So it's a, it's an issue that we're hoping is going to resolve itself pretty quickly um, because of the, the widespread um, and the effect that it's got on everybody. Yeah, I think just to add to that, I think the uh, by providing into your, into, your, into your privacy notice, you are allowing for a discussion with your data subjects on, on what's happened with their personal data so that they can be in control of it. Essentially, they can make the decisions. Now, if you put it into your privacy notice, what, 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 what could occur is that the data subject then says, OK, well, um, how have you evaluated the risks associated with that transfer? Um, or even if they say, well, that's illegal, you say, well, this is how we've, we, we've evaluated the, the risks behind that transfer. And it may be that you've been using a platform for, like, let's say, PowerSchool, and I'm not saying but whether PowerSchool is um, affected by this or not. But that could be all the student information that is stored within PowerSchool and that's, and that's stored within the cloud on a US-based server. So there's the discussion there with the parent is to say, or the or the child is to say, well, 
we've been using Power School for the past 10 years and all of your academic information is within Power School. These are the risks that we have determined associated with that data being hosted hosted within within their cloud. And our options are A, B, C, D, E, F, G um, in order to mitigate you the, the effect of your data and the and the and the impact of of of, of Shrems too. Um, and that's going to take some time for us to mitigate those risks. And you know, the, the recourse for you is for you to withdraw your child or withdraw yourself from the school because there's no way that we can deliver our, our educational services contracts to you um, uh, by uh, by by not using PowerSchool, and that is just the, one of the sort of the, the 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 practical issues that are being faced. But if you can have that open you know, uh, the open and transparent conversation with your data subject, then for me, you are essentially compliant with the law. It's those it's those organisations that are um, uh, negligent and, um, and and do so proactively. That are the ones there that are likely that are likely to see the fines and the dissuasive um, the dissuasive action, um, and that's quite important to when you when you look at the Article Twenty Nine Working Party guidance on the applications of fines. Um, it, it, it specifically states that those organisations that are willfully negligent of their duties are the ones who are facing the fines. Now, I cannot see that if you've done the risk assessment of the personal data that's being transferred and you've mitigated as much as as is practically possible um i cannot see that that's being willfully negligent therefore you are protecting yourself somewhat even though in law it's theoretically illegal um i don't know whether you've got anything else there to add on, on that heidi well i was just going to kind of jump in and just just kind of reassure everyone that if they were transferring on the privacy shield although it's been un invalidated by the court the, the companies that are subscribed to the, the Privacy Shield in the US um, are still bound by the, the same provisions. They're still self-certifying. The organization that, that regulates them is still very much in effect. So they are still answerable and accountable for how they're using the data. So um, it's this issue about whether US surveillance um, and law enforcement companies, or sorry, authorities can access the data, which is the problem. Um, but if as part of that risk assessment, you've you've used this company without any issue. They're still bound by those same provisions as a privacy shield. Um, sorry, bound by the bound by the same provisions in the privacy shield. That's what I meant to say. Um, so going forward, actually, there is no real difference in their accountability. It's just the fact that the EU, and it, it is a, a massive just the fact, but it's just the fact that the EU have said, actually, too many people have access to this data. You can sniff the data before it even access, um, enters the country. Um, and we don't have any rights as, as, as people in the union. We don't have any rights in our data um, to, to, to challenge that that the access of law enforcement companies in the same way that, that the US um, citizens do. So I think it's just worth putting in context. I probably rambled, but what I'm trying to say is I'm trying to put in context that if they're, if they're signed up to the Privacy Shield, they're still signed up to the Privacy Shield and they still want to look after your data and they still want your business. So it's worth having a conversation with those companies to see whether there are any, there are any issues. So mentioning to them, you know, what they'd have to do if they, they got a, a, a request from a, 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 um, a law enforcement company. Can they, uh, can they contact you first so that you can decide whether or not that information goes? Try and wriggle around some of the, some of the contract um, clauses that way. Um, I think, Heidi, I think I was also going to say that this is, a, this is essentially a temporary issue is yeah no, it's not hopefully yeah issue. it's yeah. a temporary issue that's going to be resolved by both parties both the eu and the us want this issue resolved because it's not good for anyone to be stuck in this gray area it's affecting so many yeah so so there's we updated standard contract clauses that that actually reflect the obligations of of the gdpr and then those third parties in the us are going to amend their standard contract clauses and it may be deemed that that that, that is a vehicle that 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 can that can be used but in the meantime as uh, as as organizations processing personal data and the transferring it to the us um you need to understand what your what the risks are associated with that processing whilst you're in that in this gray area so i wouldn't focus on there, there, there's and I've seen it in many schools, it seems this focus on we can't process personal data, we can't transfer it, we need to stop, we need to find some open source version of Google that's not Google because potentially that's in the um, in, in, in the US. 
um, or, or the same for, for Office 365. But in fact, it is on some of those platforms, you can actually pay more and you can choose where your data center is, is going to be located. So it's not in the US. And that may also be the case for, this, for some of these other providers. But you can you can only, only come to those that determination if you first of all uh, recorded or done that evaluation of where your data is located and where it's being transferred to and what, and what categories are going from A to B and then what the risks are in order for you to manage it whilst we're in this gray area. And at some point in the future, um, in the near future, that gray area is going to be black and white. And it, well, when it becomes black and white, you then need to be able to be, be in a position that you can uh, ensure that you are black and white, but you're not going to be able to do that unless you've mapped your personal data and understand which which categories go from, from A to B. So that's like the most important part. Absolutely. Um, Hi, there's, there's, a, there's a question here from Rachel in terms of um, what if the data processor is US-based but hosts in the EU but is providing services that require US-based employees to access the data? Great question. It is a great question, and I'm going to use the typical lawyer answer of it depends. <laughs> um, if those US-based employees are in the union, <laughs> then the, the information is being hosted in the EU and the GDPR would apply. Um, as long as the information isn't going back to the the mothership in the US, you this you wouldn't bite this this um, issues that we're talking the issues that we're talking about today wouldn't bite. Um, however, if the um, the US based employees are based in the union and as part of their service provision, they have a um, say a, 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 a system that is that it that is um, accessed by their their colleagues in the US, then of course, yes, Shrems 2 would bite um, in that respect. Um, Paul's come back with another question about would I haven't, I haven't read this. So I don't know what GAFAs are. What are GAFAs, Paul? <laughs> I, think, well, what, I think Paul, what, basically what, what Paul's saying is um, are the risks greater with the smaller processes than they are with the larger 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 organizations for example class dj's insist on obtaining explicit consent um i think there's a risk the risks are that and we see this quite often is that there's not generally an understanding about many suppliers of data protection law and specifically within the um within the us and there's uh, that their interpretation is is very different in many in many cases so i think that you have to um i mean first of all facebook for our pause has confirmed facebook here I bet if any of you have seen the, um, the the documentary on Netflix around um, uh, around social media, then I would I, I, I would migrate away from using any, any sort of Facebook connected um, apps or anything like that. But we're looking at the the Googles and the Amazon. You then need to look very closely at your at your contract. Um, so if you're using Amazon for hosted services, or 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 if you're using um, using Google for uh, uh, for G Suite as we do as a business. But, but us as a business in those instances, uh, we can choose where our data is, is hosted. And then contractually, we can look at the security provisions associated with who has access to the, to the data, whether that's someone from the US or someone from the, um, someone from, 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 from the union. Um, so, so, so go back to Rachel's question there. Whilst you know, if it's hosted in the, in the EU, then the security protections afforded to that should be quite clear in terms of it falls under the, under the GDPR. And then, in terms of the access by the U.S. 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 party or U.S. US support to maintain that, and um, there needs to be some clear statements in terms of um, the uh, the regularity of that access and how it is accessed, because essentially that access should be should be occasional. And I'll give you um, uh, another point on this. So within the um, within within the app, so within our app, every each instance or each license is is like a ring fenced castle of its own its own instance and as a business nine cannot access that at all the only time we, we can access that is that if you um put us as a, as a named user so you're working with one of our consultants and you want them to be part of your app or you have a problem and you for example you you don't know how to complete a dpia and you can press a push, push a button and you can give us occasional access that is time bound and you set the time limit and that's you inviting us in, and there are and, and there are the relevant security protections afforded to you in terms of us accessing the, the the data that is within the within the app. Now, most of the data that's in the app is not going to be personal data because it's a governance platform, but it's going to be commercially sensitive data um, to you as a, as an organisation. And and going back to Rachel's point, it's you understanding Rachel's in terms of how that third party 
who hosts your data within the EU is given access to their support team from the, from the EU from, from from America and how that's and how that's can and how that's uh, controlled. Can I quickly jump in and and just clarify the derogation point, Mark? Yeah, we've had a question about um, whether you use Article Forty Nine One C, which we were talking about as a derogation and another mechanism that you can use to transfer data. Um, and there's a bit, I think, a bit of confusion that you must have SCCs in place as well. The the derogations are actually alternatives to the SCCs. So if you looked at, I need to have a quick look at my GDPR. I think it's Article Forty Five, um, Forty Six, and Forty Seven. Um, yeah, 40, 44 sets out the general principles, 45, 46 and 47, um, 48 and 49, in fact, all relate to transfers of personal data. You will see that the GDPR sets out a number of mechanisms. It will talk about adequacy decisions, um, which is why it was important for us to explain at the beginning that the privacy shield was like a limited adequacy decision for the US. So it only applied to those companies that had self-certified with the um, with the privacy shield. There's also um, a range of other mechanisms. Standard contractual clauses are the most common. And then if the, the, the GDPR basically says that if none of those um, are applicable, then you can look at derogations. And the derogations are to do with contract um, and to do with consent. So the derogations are within Article um, 49. <clears throat> Matt has asked a question, is it possible with GC for education to also choose where information is stored? Um, <clears throat> now, I believe, Matt, um, and if you're buying the license, I think you 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 guys were um, choose the cloud security assessment. Um, I believe it's a paid for option. So, you, so if you've got the free version of GC for Education, I believe it's it's not an option. But if you are are, are doing a more advanced level of GC for Education and you're paying for the license, then it's actually a paid for option where you can then choose your your data center location. Um, but the guys would pick that up. Um, specifically for you, um, uh, uh, and and Rachel then just uh, just answered that for uh, for me. So thank you, uh, Rachel. <laughs> um, also, also, Google, um, if I remember rightly, Google and Microsoft, Mark, they have actually um, put together the standard contractual clauses, haven't they? As as part of their, so they're trying to cover all bases at the moment. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, and for us, you know, with our with it, with, with the apps that we've chosen uh, on the Azure tenancy. Our data centers are located within um, uh, Dublin and, and, and Amsterdam, um, but then we can, you know, for specific when when uh, if there are specific issues with, for example, storing data within the um, European Union, we can then choose to uh, put specific instances in different locations where our clients are. Um, so, and, and I think you will, you will see more and more of that um, over the next few years in terms of the and and it will probably um, going back to Paul's point. You'll probably see that first of all with um, the larger the larger app providers, um, but newer newer larger app providers that are newer businesses than the older companies um, within educate within edtech. So the older edtech businesses, what we've seen is that their code has been built over thirty years, and you've laid code and code and code and code and code, and um, and them being able to move that code base and then have it geographically dispersed. Is a lot more difficult than than a newer edtech provider that has recently coded their platform over the past few few years and has specifically designed it around um, a cloud-based architecture. So um, I think there, there there's a range of different considerations and then a range of sort of develop developments that's going to happen. Um, Elizabeth, so the SCCs of Google and MS um, obviate the need for ent enterprise versions of Edu. Is that a would you say that's a I don't think we can actually specifically answer that question. Um, depending on where you're located, um, the contract in your for Google or for Microsoft is likely to be um, a slightly different. So I think um, specifically in terms of your, you know, if if you've got a decision in one specific country, that may not necessarily be replicated at this time to all individual all individual jurisdictions. So you're, you're going to have to look at your own contract in your own con country to uh, uh, to determine whether um, uh, there, there would be a need to go to enterprise versions of Edu or, or, or not. It all comes down to risk at the end of the day, Mark, doesn't it? Just be aware of what you're doing, what applies to you, what data you've got, 
how you're using it just to make sure that as always you're only using the absolute necessary absolute minimum should i say necessary to to um, reach your intended um uh, purpose um actually there's a there's a little plug that we can do here because we've been asked by vivian and i have answered the question already but she's saying about is there a central repository mark of assessments of third party <laughs> data processors for schools? yeah yeah um, because i know what's in development so maybe you'd like to um... yeah so um so if you think about the your record of processing is your central hub for your compliance program and the sort of i've i think we've said that so many times over, over these past few webinars your, your, your ROPA and then links into your DPIAs, it, it links into your legitimate interest assessment, um, it then links into uh, your incidents, it links into information rights requests, and it links into your third parties who you share personal data with. So, so the, the app that we, the, the different features that we have in development, so basically the third party assessment will include a database of all the third party edtech providers and their current status of level of compliance um, against data protection law. And then there'll be an option where that, um, where that third party can then have nine validate that what they are saying is actually true in terms of us doing an audit. And you as, a, you as an organization, you can add in th other third parties that maybe aren't in the database that then can be shared as a lookup with with all other all other schools who are using the platform or, or, or all other organizations and what that's going to generate is it's going to generate a league table of organizations um of their tech providers that actually take uh, privacy seriously and not just privacy and cyber security so if you're searching for a new hr platform or you're searching for a new version of cloud dojo um there'll there'll, there'll be categories that you can search and and it will soon filter up that the ones who have the greater level of protections that schools choose and the ones with a lower level of protections they don't but the ones that offer lower level of protections will naturally be motivated to want to be in that in that higher league table so so, the, so that database that functionality is currently in in development and will be launched as a feature within the next um within the next six months but also importantly we have this information rights module that essentially links directly into your processing activities. And a lot of our schools have an issue with subject access requests where the, um, the individual is asking for everything associated with them in the school. What our feature will do will force the, uh, the data subjects to choose the processing areas, such as admissions or HR or academic, and then specifically choose the, the processing activities within, the, within there about where they want uh, their, the, 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 where they want the requests from to mitigate the impact of a school having to go through everything that you're that you're starting with a smaller the most necessary request for the individual and then you're scaling up so we're sort of reversing it and that's something else that's part of the uh, part of the features so um, yeah, Heidi, is there anything else that we haven't answered? Um, I know we're sort of out of time now, so oh, I think bit. if you have if you have any other questions, then um, then feel free to to fire them through to myself or Heidi. Um, we're not doing any more webinars now until the end of October. Um, the nine team will all be in touch uh, uh, to um, to give you some more information around uh, uh, and send you a copy of this slide deck. Um, if you want more information on trends too, there's more analysis of that within within the app. Obviously, if you're signing up for a trial, you get access to that um, and the trends to um, video in two minutes. So I'd like to thank you all for your, for your time this morning. Um, hopefully, it's been valuable for you. Um, I've, I've certainly enjoyed this this webinar with Heidi. So thank you, Heidi, for taking the time out um, and uh, answering all the questions. And um, and yeah, so ha everyone have a have a great day and uh, look forward to you joining us on the next webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Stay safe, everyone.